uh, afternoon. Lord, we bless you. We thank you for creating our time to, to join us. I want to say something just to correct. Uh, I'm not a minister. I'm just a brother. And uh, so I'm not a pastor. <laughs> Pastor like to call minister, I'm not a minister, so I, I just wanted to, to say that. Okay, now, beloved, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you are joining us for the first time in this uh, platform, is MES Forum. It's a forum that is not run as if I'll be here talking and talking down to you all. No, it's a platform for everybody to, to create this kind of... Uh, uh, a forum that we can share what God has placed in our lives and share with each other so that we can learn from each other. So it's not going to be a platform where one person will just speak and no, you, myself, everyone is going to speak and we want to learn from each other, we want to learn that which God has given to you that, is help, that has been helping you as the head of your home or as a man or as a father. So that's what this platform really creates, create, has been created for. We thank God for uh, our pastor that has created this uh, platform and give us this opportunity to be able to share our minds together in accordance to the will of God and share our challenges with each other and learn from each other. So, and we have it quarterly. I mean, yeah, it's quarterly, isn't it? Uh, uh, and uh, they had, we had the first one in March, wasn't it, Pastor? Yeah. I think it was in March, yeah. March, and yes. then we are having another one now in uh, in uh, July. So the next one is going to be around uh, November or thereabouts. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, so we would definitely uh, want to, just wanted to learn this because I'm seeing some new people joining us for the first time. The beauty of this is, is it has no boundary. So wherever you are, you can join us. Okay. That's the, the first bit done. So what are we talking about today? Thank God for we. I don't know how many of us were able to join the the open air from the starting point uh, where we started yesterday at our conference. The theme for this year was uh, is your will be done. But we now decided to well say okay, your will be done is our theme for the conference. It'd be nice to actually see how that relates to us as fathers, how that relates to us as 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 uh, men. How that relates to us as family heads, the will be done. So that's what we want to try and explore today and, and discuss. So we, we for those that were not in the conference, our team uh, Bible text is taken from book of Matthew 6, 10, said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That was Matthew 6, 10. Jesus was simply teaching us there how to pray, to pray that the Father's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's Jesus teaching us how we should be praying that prayer and how to pray that prayer. But when I read this, before we even go deeper to understand what is, why is Jesus telling us to pray this way? And, and let's just try, just say, let me try to understand the context of the will we are talking about here. Okay. You can go to the dictionary and find out that one of the dictionary, one of the definitions that kind of struck my mind was this. He said the will means what one wishes or wants to happen or has determined will happen. What one wishes to happen or wants to happen or has determined will happen. That's the will. Okay, but which, which implies that what is God telling us in that time? God is simply asking in accordance to Matthew 16, God is ask, simply asking us or teaching us how to pray that God's wishes or will, if in quote, or God wishes or what he has determined to happen in our life, we should pray. Okay, so the way God's will be done is we can use the will and replace it with what God wishes in our lives to be done. What God wants or has determined needs to be established in our life. But let's take this back a bit. Let's, let's look into this a bit more deeper. The first time I read this, I've been reading this, but since we've been looking at this thing, 
the question came to my mind that why is God teaching us to pray that his wishes be done on earth? Why? He said, as it is in heaven, which means the will of God is already, the wishes of God is already done in heaven. But he was asking us to pray that his will be done on earth. Why was he asking that question? Why was he encouraging us? And, and I, I was looking at this, and it, the first, another thing that I kind of mind, the Holy Spirit kind of said, he's asking you because he knows that the will of God is already done in heaven because he came from there. He knows what will, what wishes, what operates in heaven. And now he came to the earth to save, to die for our sins, and he was also able to experience what was going on on earth. And based on his experience there, Jesus was actually speaking from an informed position. It was on earth when he was telling us this. He was speaking from an informed position. I haven't witnessed what was going on. I haven't seen in human flesh, not as God now, in human flesh, what was going on. He then told us, say, pray that the will be done. He wasn't saying, ask for the will to come. He said, pray mm. that the will be done. Yes. So the will is also here. He said, be pray. That he should be done because he's seeing what is going on. So that is actually what is going to be leading to our discussion point today, which is as father, how do we ensure that God's will is done in our homes or in our families or in our life? As fathers, as men, how do we ensure that God's will is done or God's will? is in charge in our homes, in our family, and in our lives. That's the topic of discussion today. So I don't want to start asking us, oh, what is God's will? <laughs> because if I ask that question, everybody know what God's will is. And that's why Jesus Christ was not asking, I ask for my will. No, he knows that you know what, what God wills. And if I ask, yeah, God's will is salvation. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to obey his covenant. He wants us to follow his commandment. He wants us to be sexually pure. He wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants us to, to understand that believers will suffer. He wants us to be thanksgiving always. We know all this, right? So the first question I would like us to really dive into is this. Having realized that we know what God's way is, how do we then ensure that he's in charge or he's done in our family? in our homes and in our lives. So our first question today, uh, beloved, is our discussion point, which I'm gonna open to the platform now, is as fathers, what, what are the factors that we think compete with God's will or wishes in our homes, in our decision-making? Remember the topic is, how do we ensure that God's will be done? We know what the God's will is. So the first question I'd like us to open to the floor is, as fathers, as men, what do we think are the competing factors competing against God's will in our lives, in our decision-making, as fathers, as men, in our homes? I'll leave that for opening it up, please. Thank you, Ken. Can I ask uh, my uh, brothers to please unmute their mics now? Yeah. Hopefully please there's no problem. Mind. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully Please there's no... Mike and, and and thank you, Pastor. Thank you. And, and 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 let's let's discuss this. Let's discuss. So I repeat the question: As fathers, what are the factors do we think compete with God's will or wishes in our homes, in our decision making, in our lives, and in our family? <laughs> If I'm if I may start and say something, Kenneth. Thank you so much. What a, a great approach to this to this discussion this afternoon. Um, I'm reminded in Mark chapter four, uh, Luke chapter eight, and I believe it's Matthew chapter thirteen, about the parable of the sower, the the four soils. The first we know, uh, wayside. The second we know, the seed was sown on stoning or rocky ground. The third, the third sto uh, soil comes to mind. That's the seed sown amongst thorns and in the interpretation of this of this parable uh, we find that the seed did not die okay 
And the interpretation is this, that it was sown among thorns, but it was not productive. And the interpretation is, 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 is that the word is sown on good ground. But however, the cares for other things, the cares of, the, you know, of this world, things of the world, the pleasures of the world, the pursuit of other things, they come in and choke the world so that the world is not fruitful. But the world did not die. So in essence, I'm saying the world in this context represents the will of God we want to do. However, there are competing, competing priorities that we pursue. You know, we're talking about the factors that, that, are, that tend to come in. But these are the competing pressures that, that we, we, career maybe, business maybe, you know, make more, more money maybe. I don't know, maybe because now you are married, now you have a child or two, you know, the family becomes first place. It's to be what? In first place. Okay, so um, what I'm simply saying, if we if we look at that particular text, oh, yeah. Bible, you, you will find out that, that it was not, it's not that the seed or the world is not good, However, the, 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 the soil had other things to deal with, to grapple with. And the result was that the will was no longer being done. Rather, the man's energy and strength, wisdom and abilities and capabilities were now focused on this other pressure, on other things of the world, the cares of the world. Question then is how did the will overcome this? The major competition is, is, is between it's, it's God on one side, the protagonist, and then the world as the antagonist, and we are caught in the middle. Yes. So which way do we lean to? Exactly. So, so Pastor, I, I don't want to go to how first. Okay. You've just, you just highlighted some key point there that we're looking at competing factors. You, you, you just, you just, there are two, two, two things that struck me when you were speaking, which is say, just that you make it uh, to, to the sea being sown, and the seed is sown is a desire for that soil to bring forth fruit. Yes. But it was competing with other factors as it tried to bring forth that fruit. There are other competing weeds. There are competing plants around to try and soak that nutrient away yes. to, to shock that seed. So you just mentioned competing factors, competing distractions. It may, the distractions may also be other plant that is trying to compete with that seed they are not really doing anything. They want to survive as well. Mm -hmm. They want to live. So there are competing factors. That's not like they are evil, but things that needs to have a place as well, among other chains of things. How do you balance this? How do you ensure that those things that want to have a life, that want to be able to also survive, and how do you balance it with things that we kind of follow what God really asks you to do? You just, that's one thing that I took from there. The yeah. plants wants to grow. The seed wants to grow, but there are other things around it. They want yeah. to grow along with it. Yes. Struggling for the same nutrient. How do you carry those things along to make sure that the real focus point, you're not distracted away from it? Okay. And if I may offer an answer there, can I thank you again for the way you are leading this. It's, it's about priorities. Okay, uh, you know, on, on an ordinary day, you have a to-do list, one, two, three, four, in the order of importance. Of course, sometimes you have an emergency and then the last thing comes on top. So it, again, it's what's important to you. I cannot develop for you. It's an order or a scale of preference by which you do your stuff. You need to decide for yourself and for your house, what is important. I love the way Joshua says it to us. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house. And, and so it's about priority. I've often taught in church, you, you can testify to that. Your number one relationship is with God. Number one. Because he's the reason you are alive. And without life, what is, where is marriage going to come from? Are you going to have a child or children or do the job or business or career or make more money or buy the house? So your number one relationship, your number one priority should be God and God alone. And then of course, your relationship with your wife and then the children. And then whatever else is, 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 comes next. 
So in terms of prioritizing all of these factors, we need to put God first. Okay. There's let me let me speak. Let me speak of, of all of us on this platform. There's nobody here who will not go to God when there's a challenge or a situation. <laughs> there are things you go to the boss for, you know, to go to the manager for, to go to the landlord for, you go to the money company, the bank, you go. But when it comes to matter of life, I mean, the real issues about life, we go to God. And so I believe it's about priori prioritizing what matters to us. If we will learn to put God first, so doing God's will, or God's will become coming to bear in our families, and we ensure that God's will is done, it will not be a problem. It is God's will for you to have a peaceful home, to spend time in prayers with your family, maybe get a day of fasting. It is God's will. And that which you do with God, for God, will almost, will almost guarantee impact every area of your life. With, I'm telling you, that relationship with God will impact every area of your life. Do you have a, a challenge in the business or in the, at the workplace? You come to God about it. So when we reorder, as, as some of us, I hope we will, or order, okay, and put God first, that first relationship is almost certainly guaranteed to have an influence and an impact that God prepares you for your day. God prepares you for the workplace, prepares you to go and work in maybe House of Parliament, prepares you to work in the banks in the city of London, prepares you to run your own business, maybe in the corner shop, down the high street. Whatever it is, God's hand will be everywhere. So if we learn to prioritize our relationship with God and what God desires of us, his will, then every other thing will fall into place with the, with the grace and mercy of God upon our lives. Thank you, Pastor. I know they are. Thank you very much. So Amen. I'll open it. I'll open it to other others now, please. Pastor, I've just kind of really, really highlighted some key points here. Understanding okay. the competing, understanding competing factors, under, highlighting how we could. These competing factors are not all bad. They're prioritizing how you actually execute them and guiding, being guided by putting God first. That's basically in summary what Pastor has highlighted. I'll leave it to Pastor Ed, uh, past, uh, Brother Sam, uh, and the rest of you. Noah, uh, sorry, I cannot get the last person's name. Please, I will want to hear your views on this. All right, Minister Ken, thank you so much. You said earlier on that you are not a minister. You speak like a pastor. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you don't uh, uh, seek the Damascus Road experience, okay? So <laughs> you better just lie down before you get knocked down by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> anyway, also, please, my apologies that I don't have my video because my little boy, two-year-old, is just, he keeps coming in and out and, you know, uh, coming in with noise. I will put it on momentarily and then... Um, I'll switch it off again. If I uh, get your question very right, you said, what are the things that are competing for the uh, will of God being done in our lives, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. In, thank you. In our homes, in our lives, and in, our, in everything we do, yeah. And as men, yes. Um, thank you, Pastor Sonny, for that powerful input. I just will give my own little contribution to this in the sense of making um, reference to Romans chapter 12, verse, verses 1 to 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, this is actually Paul uh, writing and say, I beseech you therefore, brethren from the King James translation by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service that's number one and then he further goes on to say he says and be not conformed to this world but the remedy is be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. So there are three types of will here anyway, good, acceptable and perfect will of God. We are not going to go into that. We are only just dealing and discussing with the things that are contending against the perfect will of God being done in our lives. The first thing Paul says here is, he says we should present our bodies a living sacrifice. Um, if we present our bodies as living sacrifice, live a holy life, a consecrated life, a life that has no uh, blemish, we will be able to discern. We will be able to uh, know what is the uh, will of God for our lives. And then the father goes on to say, be not conformed to this world. Why is it that people cannot really, why is it that people can't really know what the will of God is for their life or they can't ascertain, they cannot say for sure what the will of God is for their life because of conformity. We conform, we, we blend in. We, uh, we, we join, we join the world, we join certain groups, certain cliques, you know. We are Christians, but we still hang out with our, our people. We say we are from the same tribe. We've come a long way. We live in the West here, but we have a propensity of hanging out with the same tribe, with same people, our my kind of people, and we have parties, we have a, a social events. Some, some may be even old classmates. We still conform to old classmates. The other day I was seeing a guy who calls himself a pastor here and he, was, they, he, he hung up with a group of guys, they were all wearing white. And he said, and we are still maintaining the group and clique. And I found out that these guys were his former boys who were uh, in the Black Axe movement when he was in, in the higher institution in Nigeria. So conformity can um, uh, prevent us, can hinder us from discerning the will of God. And these are things that militate, things that contend with us knowing the will of God for our lives. Now the remedy is this, that's why I love the word of God, it doesn't just give us uh, 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 a word without uh, a remedy he said be ye, but be ye transformed how can we know the perfect will of God be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind the word transformation there means to metamorphose it's like a caterpillar metamorphosis from being the state of a caterpillar to a butterfly be it transformed by the renewing of your mind. When your mind is renewed, just to be able to give time for others to make their own comment, that you may then, after your mind is renewed and going through these processes, you will now be able to discern what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God for your life. This is just my contribution for now. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Ed. Thank you. <laughs> really, really uh, very wonderful dimension you came from there. We were just reading Romans 12. I, I, looked, I looked at some of the points that I've highlighted there, which you nailed as well. Basically looking at one of the strongest things that competes with, with God's will is conformity. Conformity to the patterns of this world. You know? So we cannot remove ourselves from the word, but how do we do we allow the world to take charge of us? How do we balance it or separate ourselves and also make to ensure that the will of the will of God is affected, applied on our daily activity? That's the key. So, so I will let other pastor, uh, brother Sam, or I don't know whether you're pastor, sir. Um, so please contribute again. I like everybody to contribute to this. Good morning. Uh, is it afternoon now? Sorry, uh, because I was in a, I was in a meeting from ten o'clock 
to 11 o'clock. Maybe that's why my, my mind is still signing as morning. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Pastor Sam and my Pastor Sonny. And thank you so much, my brother. And the last speaker, thank you as well. Um, I've been disturbing uh, Pastor Sonny. In fact, two weeks ago, I said to him, when is the meeting? Last week again, I said, when is the meeting? So when I was studying my wife, he said, I said, Pastor Sonny will be thinking this time, so does he mean he doesn't keep records? He said, no, no, he won't say so. I know that you have a lot in mind. I really, really like this meeting. And I just pray that uh, the committee or those that have set this platform will make adjustment. That quarter day for me is a little bit, I know you have other programs, but going back to what we have discussed, like you said, said as fathers, the head of the family, what are those factors that compete with the will of God in our lives or in our family? Am I correct? correct sir. David says something in Psalm 51. He said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I keep on telling people that as a Christians, when you deviate, you know, except you are not honest. Because the Bible says that the spirit of God bear it witness with our own spirit that we are the children of God. Right. So what comes in, if I go straight to the point to provide an answer to this in my own views, is almost in line with what all the speakers have spoken is that we allowed our flesh to take over our spirit. Mm. Allow the flesh, we are contending with two forces. We are contending with, that is why David said, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, which means that there are spirit that comes in to contend with the right spirit. And he won now those right spirit to overcome that wrong spirit. Mm. So once we deviate from being with the will of God, is that there's a force, there's a that is contending. With the spirit of God. They said, Bible says that they that live in the flesh cannot please God. So this morning, a brother was just talking about the case of Brother Samson, how Samson went into Lelilah from there, allowed the flesh to lure him into what was not God's will. He went into a relationship, and that relationship cost him his life. So, what I can say in summary is that what is competing with the will of God is when we allow the flesh which the brother was talking about transformation. When we allow the flesh to overpower the spirit of God, we begin now to argue and say, but this is God's will as a Christian, I know, but I can also do this to get this because we want to satisfy the flesh. Thank you. Thank you very much. So many things to unpack there. When we allow it again, you can see everything is aligning with what we work around. Ed, uh, Pastor Ed, Sebra, son, uh, Pastor uh, uh, Sune, and you just kind of kind of nailed it there. In literary terms, the flesh. When we allow our flesh to start taking over our spirit, and then you start saying the borderline, you make the excuse. We start we start giving excuses. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would do it because we also make sure we do this. You started trying to you start creating an excuse. There's, there's before I allowed another the other brothers to speak. There's one thing. A minister yesterday uh, said during our, our conference, he said at uh, the starting point, he said, sometimes you see yourself overreacting to things, things that should not really, you shouldn't react to, you shouldn't really, you react. Mm. She said, there are triggers, there are things that you need to deal with. You can't just let it go. And when you not see yourself overreacting unnecessary to cause kind of anger in people, it's just, People feel, like, why is he reacting that way? You begin to understand that there are triggers you need to deal with. That's not God's will. Mm. So it's just it's just you coming to that realization. And your spirit will be telling you this. That the flesh could be the, the pride and say, you know, no, he did something wrong. That's why I reacted that way. No. Should you have reacted that way? So it, 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 when she mentioned that, it kind of struck a chord with me. That's, I just wanted to use an example here. We were saying, we started trying to create an excuse. We know when we're deviating, we know. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, God's spirit is in everyone. It depends on which one you want to take precedent over, whether it's God's spirit or the spirit of the world. Thank you very much for that, for that Samuel. 
So, uh, Noah, you are still on this call. <laughs> I'm not going to let you go like that. <laughs> what is your views on this, Noah? Yeah, uh, I agree that the flesh is something that um, uh, is in conflict with God's will in our lives. I think something else is also the pursuit of like materialistic things, like money, for example. Um, Jesus says in Matthew 6 that you can't serve two masters um, for your loved one and despise the other. I feel like people who, who pursue things like money um, um, above pursuing God and pursuing a relationship with God, allowing God to do his will in their life, um, is obviously in conflict with God doing his will because if someone is constantly pursuing money and materialistic things, then it, it can be harder for God to use them for his will and to like further his his kingdom on earth. Uh, yeah, that's what I think. Thank you, Noah. Money's flesh is one money pursuing the things again relating to things that will please the flesh because money do not please. Money is not, not has, the spirit of God has nothing to do with money, really. We, we are pursuing this money to satisfy our fleshly uh, desires. Uh, to, 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 that's what it is. Uh, Spirit of God, whether the spiritual man do not care about that money part. We just want it for our own flesh to satisfy all that needs, which is a necessity anyway. Thank you. There's another brother on the call. Sorry, I don't have your name. Is Regina or something? That's my friend, Sir Reginald. Sir Reginald, please will you meet uh, your mic and... Uh, Join in this conversation, please. Um, good afternoon, my brothers. Um, sorry, I cannot um, um, I'll show my face right now. I can show my face very briefly, actually, just to see who I am. He's a very handsome um, man. There you go. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, I agree with my brothers here. Yeah? I think I think we men especially have of uh, challenges and I need to go back to the question basically in terms of you know what what are the um, challenges or the mitigating um, or, the, uh, or the conflicting um, factors sorry factors, <laughs> that, factors. That, that means yeah. that means you know we sometimes don't fulfill the um, will so I'm, I'm getting some distractions so set up uh, the the question again sorry my brother so as, as fathers, uh, what are the factors that compete with God's will? Or with yes, with God's will. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I'm with you. Um, now, we, we need to actually ask ourselves, what, what is God's will? You know, um, Pastor Sonny may define God's will one way, and uh, Brad Ken and Brother Ed may define it in a different way. So, so we need to actually personalize it. We need to actually come to a consensus in terms of how, what we mean by God's will. Mm -hmm. But however we define it, we, it, it, it just means that we need to conform with what God has told us to do, what God has told us to comply with. Mm -hmm. um, I know of people who can go to church yeah, and be you know, full of the spirit, and I'm full of I'm full of I'm full of um, wisdom and the way they talk and articulate themselves, they are like you know pure Christians. And then they go for they, they go outside there, for example, and they go to the office setting. So, for example, if you walk in the, if you walk in an office where they swear a lot or they talk about women a lot, and because you want to conform, somebody used the word conform because you want to be part of the group because you want to because you want to be uh, uh, part of the part of the part of the group, you know they therefore deviate and therefore want to be seen as part of the group and therefore do things that they should not do. You know, I always believe that you know if you're a Christian, you should be a Christian not just in the church, but in the office, in the supermarket, in the car. You know, when I'm in the car, when there's a road rage, you know, somebody cuts you off. You know, does that mean we should not be upset? Does that mean we should not, we should not, we should not um, be upset? Of course, as Christians, we can be upset. You know, but but there's a limit to what you can do. There's you know, there's there's a level of tolerance that you should have. 
um, that that you should exhibit as a Christian and not just behave like every other person that is non-Christian. We need to be able to say, as a Christian, you know, you should be able to um, stand up as a Christian wherever you are. You know, don't just come to church and behave like, act like a Christian. And then when you go to the office, you act like the office people, you swear, you talk about women, you make some remarks, you know, they crack some jokes and you're laughing when you should be frowning and, you know, telling them. You know, sometimes if you cannot beat them, you don't have to join them. Why, why must you join them? So we, we need to always be very mindful. These are the challenging factors that, that makes it difficult. And, and for me, for example, you know, um, mine is the pressure of work. You know, I, I work very long hours and I come back, I'm tired, you know, to, to then find that opportunity to, to, to pray with the children, to pray with the family becomes a bit difficult. Even over the weekend, I'm, I'm working. So that's my that's for me personally i'm just i'm just opening up here that's my challenge you know as, as the man of the house i should be able to call the family together and i do that regularly but now and again the pressures of work you know you come back home you, you know the, the, you're, you're tired you know and uh, you want to call the family but you know you're tired even the kids are saying okay come let's pray okay yes we'll do it we'll do it we'll do it and we, you end up not doing it you know we all go through these situations and we need to be mindful that our environment peer pressure and, and, uh, and our spirituality, you know, the, the way we see things do not, do, not, do not become an obstacle or become um, a challenge in the way we, we, we keep with the, what God has um, asked us to do. We need to be very, you know, sometimes I ask a question, you know, if we've prayed today, you know, some people ask a question, maybe not me, some people ask a question, if you pray today, why are you praying again tomorrow and the next tomorrow and then the, the week after? Why, why do we, we have to top up? You know, because there are many challenges. We, there are many challenges in life. And if you say, okay, I've prayed for today. Why do I have to pray for tomorrow, the next tomorrow and say the same thing? I've given tight for today. Why am I giving tight again next week? It's a top up process, the way, the way I see it. And, and you have to always be on your guard because the devil is always looking for an opportunity to, to step in. And if you're not on your guard all the time, then God forbid the devil will take over and you don't want that to happen in your family. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So you just mentioned one key thing there. You don't, if you, if you cannot uh, uh, beat them, you can, I, I don't know, there was so many, you say, if you cannot, you don't have to join them. You don't have to join I don't say that again, Pastor. No, no, yeah, no, no. If, if, you cannot, if you cannot beat them, you don't have to, there's a popular saying, if you, if you cannot, I know, yeah. You don't have to join them. And what the point you raise is leading us perfectly into the second question I'm about to ask. We've exhaustively identified this as factors. And, and, and you, we've said that uh, in the church, you cannot just behave as Christian and then somewhere you behave a different person. And then uh, understanding that, understanding that there are competing factors against God's will, it, that gives you the ability to then understand how you're going to overcome this. You just make a perfect example, all of us, uh, depending where you are, we overwork. We do so many things and sometimes that seems to be competing with what God wants us to do as well. How do you balance that? And, and, and that really leads to the, the next question there that when you mention, it's going to tie, Brother Sam, Samuel, uh, the discussion and the point you raised, uh, Brother uh, Regina, is this. How do we then ensure, how do we understand these competing factors? How do we then ensure that his will is underpinned, underpinned every decision we we'll make as a father in our homes? I will understand, we know these factors now. How do we then ensure that every God's will and wishes is on, on, it underpins our decision as a father, what we do, how we behave, and what we actually uh, uh, the direction we lead our family. That's the next question. You, uh, Pastor Ed has alluded into this as we were talking. He mentioned one thing there, the mind, the mind, the transformation of the mind. And Brother Samuel, the same thing. And, and you mentioned, the, the last, uh, the, our brother that spoke so last mentioned something about pretending to be one, somebody in one way and then the other part, you are different in the other, start, in the other way of life. 
Before we go into this discussion, I want to read some group of people that answer this question and say, oh, I'm doing God's will and see what Jesus told them. I, I picked the book of Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Jesus was rebuking Poyer and he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, not, I, I, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not drive out demons and blah, blah, blah in your name? And the Lord will tell them, sorry, I don't know you guys. You evil doers. So these are the people that think that they were doing the will of God. But still, God is going to say, we don't know you. So what are the things that really, you may think that you're doing the will of God as because you've justified it in your mind that, yes, I'm really doing. You have different way because the Bible, you can bring, pull up different scripture to support why you cannot do it or why you are doing it. Even some, so in our homes, we have a way to support ourselves with different evidential proof to say, this is why I want to do it. But the real question is, really, are you just using those scripture to cover your real motive? Are you just actually using those scripture to cover your real motive? That's a question I would like us to debate now. How do we ensure that our wishes, God's wishes, underpins every decision? we make. And as we look at this, there are two things I want us to really look into. How do we guide our motives to ensure that what we do is not really based around our motive? What is the motive behind the decision we make in our homes? What is the motive behind the way we look at things in our homes? As a father, are we living a hypocritical life? We are one way to the other. We are the same way in another place. Our children are seeing this. Our families are seeing this. It's very difficult for us to be able to say, oh, we are enforcing the will of God if these two things complete each other. So I'll leave, before I continue, I'll leave this for us to contribute. How do we ensure as fathers, as, as men, that every decision is underpinned by the will of God? Thank you, Kenneth. Um, I thank you, my brothers, uh, for the conversation so far. It's, it, it's brilliant. Um, that question, I find not only the answer, but I also find a pattern to follow. In Genesis 18, where the Lord himself um, boasted about his friend Abraham. Um, in Genesis 18, you, you know the story, the Lord and his angels, God the Father, and his angels are on their way to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so in verse 16 of Genesis 18, then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to send them on the, on the way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the will of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. For me, people of God, that's the key in verse 19. God says, I know Abraham, that he would command his children and his entire household after him, that they keep the will of the Lord. So the question, to, the question about how is simply this, you as the head, and so we see Abraham here, not only head, as father of his children, but in the entire household, meaning his servants. He's, he's, he's the ones that were born in his household to his servants, and the one that, you know, those days they used to buy slaves and all of that. Everybody in this old yard, in this compound, in that household, Abraham has the power, the capacity to, to, to command them to keep the will of the Lord. I think that's the way. That's the way. This is how to. That we as fathers in our vantage positions as head of families to be able to command. If you can command the children to go to school and to get an education, surely we can command them to obey God. If we can command our, our family in terms of budget, we don't overspend, we need to pay for this and pay for that, we need to save. If we can command the family in terms of how to be astute with our economics, I'm sure we can command our, our household as well in terms of serving God. 
and doing God's will. And it's not about the rest of the world. It's just for you, your nucleus family. It's not for the rest of the wider family with all your brothers and sisters or siblings all over the extent. No, no. It's about you, your wife, child, or children. Amen. Here's God's testimony about Abraham. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. After him. I love what Paul said in the old King James Version in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. It says, follow me as I follow Christ. And my prayer is that our households and our families, our children, will follow us as we follow Christ. I have known him in order that he may command his children and his house after him. What is, I think the, 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 the wisdom is clear here. That even as we obey, our children will follow us and obey. A, a God said, speaking about Abraham, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, after him, that they keep the will of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, and that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. I thank, think. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, the bit you are going into is actually the last kind of is one of the questions I want to ask. You mentioned a very interesting word there, command. Uh, I would like to explore this later. Okay. Uh, how do we command? <laughs> so it's quite an interesting concept, especially with, with the kind of society we are in now. So, and in the scripture you read, he may, there's a word, there's the word may. It's not he should, he may. So he may command. So it would be quite interesting to explore this. Thank you for the first point that one of the way we should ensure that uh, the, uh, God, uh, the decision of the wish of God is underpinning our home is to take it as a responsibility as a father, as men, as the head of our homes, to ensure that it's our duty to command our family, to command them to Follow the rules and the precepts of God. That's the take that you're coming in. Please, I'd like to get your views on this. Come on, brother. So let's keep it flowing. Come on, come on. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I, I do have. I, uh, I do. I do have some visitors here. So. Pardon me uh, if I if I if I miss out none again. Um, I am okay. I am fully focused, but I, I'm getting lots of distractions, and that's why I don't want to put my video on. Um, okay. um, and again, I need to I need to um, appeal. I need to beg. Uh, what was the question? Is it how you how you achieve the will of God? Yeah, the question was how we understand the constraints and the competing factors. That's what we discussed at the beginning. Now, right. how do we ensure that God's will and wishes? is underpinned, underpinned every decision we make as a father, as a, in our homes, in our family, and as men. How do we then ensure that the decisions, the role we play as a father is underpinned by God's wishes and will? It is sometimes we, we overcomplicate things. I, I just don't, for, for, you know, following God's command, following God's will, it, it's not as complex as some people make it look like. You know, unless unless we want to deviate, unless we mm -hmm. uh, want to succumb to 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 the flesh, mm -hmm. to drink, you know, or to peer pressure, you know, mm -hmm. and in your and in your family too, you know, the best way to do that is to is to uh, practice what you preach. There is no point of preaching A and practicing B. Guess what? The kids might not say it, but they see it. Mm -hmm. Trust me, they do. They, they, they do. You know, you, you can come in and say all you want to say during prayer session, and then they hear you talking to your friend and saying things in languages that they don't expect a Christian to, 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 to go with. You know, so it, it is all about actually following the Bible. It's all about, you know, knowing what that God's will is and, 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 and sticking to it. And, and, but more importantly, it is about practicing what you preach not just in the family, but outside the family. It is important mm -hmm. I would do that because for me, no, nothing puts me off. If, if, if I wasn't a Christian, you know, I think I'll be, you know, and I, and I mean this sincerely and respectfully, I'll be put off by certain things I see in certain people, you know? I remember I went to, I went to work 
Yeah, I, I worked in an environment where it's like I go from place to place. And I went to this place and the brother told me, oh, forget where you came for. You know, we were carrying out refurbishment work. I was part of the management team. And he said, no, just sit down. And he said he was going to preach to me. I said, but I when I finish with you, I will have many appointments. I have many appointments. You know, that I have to, no, don't worry. By the time I finish with you, you want to go straight home. And I'm thinking, okay. And he wanted to preach to me. And I had to explain to him that, look, you know, I cannot do this now because I have so many people I would disappoint if I don't do what I came here to do and move on. This person turned out to be one of the most challenging people I've ever seen, you know, and if I wasn't a Christian, I, I'll be asking myself, so this man wanted to preach to me, and this is his character, this is the way he behaves, this is the way he talks, this is the, the first time I saw him he wanted to preach to me, is this the kind of, is this what Christianity is about? And I'll be challenging that big time if I was not a Christian. Uh, so so, so it, is, it is vital, it is important that we, we, we portray what we preach. I will not, we don't pretend about it because when you pretend about it, it will show somehow, somewhere, it, it will show. And, and to carry the will of God, you know, if you don't practice what you preach, then we're just pretending. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sir Reggie. Very good. Thanks. Um, um, what I want to say, I just want to reflect in the book of Joshua chapter one, verse eight, I'm going to read in King James Version. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all, all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success mm -hmm. for us to be able to ensure for us to ensure that whatever we are doing is in line with the will of God the basic thing I believe is that when you when I have Pastor Sonny in mind always always in mind I will try as much as possible to apply what I learned from him and when I learn what I learned from him if it is a good thing is a human man then I need to apply it. Now, what we are learning from God, said, so let us make man in our own image. We are made in his similitude. So what we are learning is when we keep on thinking about what he says, then that will enable us to apply his will in our family. But when once we take our mind off from what he says by not meditating, by not thinking, because if you don't think about person, there is no way you can do anything about him. But when we allow God to be in our mind at all times, then we will try to ensure that whatever we are doing is not out of our relationship with him, must mm. be in equilibrium, must be in the same level with what is expected of us. That's what I can say. Mm. 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 Keeping God's words in your mind and making sure that it will is to ensure that it's in equilibrium to, to kind of direct and, and guide you in what you make, in the decision you make. Uh, that you, you just, yeah, the, what you were, we were talking, kind of reflecting on the, the, the brother that spoke about, it's simple as just following the will of God, just follow his word and, and don't have any way to say, oh, this is this. <laughs> and, and, and following the will of God, it's not like prescriptive. It's just they really doing it, you, you, you will know. My son, we're doing uh, just just uh, <laughs> one thing that happened recently. So we're supposed to be doing as a church, doing fasting and prayer. I say, listen, you guys need to fast, okay? So the boy is uh, is, is 13. Uh, no, sorry, it's nine. It's just it's not even up to 10. There's no, I can't fast. You know that they are like food, so I'm not going to fast. I can't fast. So you can. Why do you mean you cannot fast? Just do it in 12. He said, okay, I'll try. The younger, the elder sister, she's a bit older, she's 13. She said, no, we don't worry, we're going to do it. They encourage her that they're going to do it. Okay, fine. <laughs> so at the back 10, he came to me and said, can't do it anymore. So you know what? He, he can. He just needs to eat nice. So you can. Just just do it, okay? So immediately they were watching. When he was 12, they rushed. He's 12, 12, we're going to break now. It's okay, go and eat. So I, I asked him. Especially in you, I said, what did you pray about? And you know what we should pray? He said, Daddy, to be honest with you, I just 
pray that God should give me the strength to complete this fasting. I said, what? Is that how you pray? Said, yes, because there's no way you could have completed. Just say, God, give me the strength. I started laughing. You didn't pray for God to bless you or give you direction. You were, you were just praying for, he said, that's all he was praying about, all true. <laughs> I just said, I, I don't turn now. When I was preparing for this, I said, okay, in that, how will I do? I say that what he was doing was really according. I gave him the scripture, go and pray on this. But he went to start praying, oh, God, just give me the strength to do it. We will actually bless that kind of prayers or something. So, what I'm saying, when I wanted to bring that into the picture, is follow the will of God, not looking at others. What is God helping, asking you to actually do as an individual? And the, the what you said, uh, I think the brother said, if I ask Ken what is the will of God, he has his own different perspective. Because we are all different mm. as human. God has made us, just, we are all human, but we have different, different purpose in life. What is that way God has commissioned? Don't get influenced and distracted by others. Follow that way. That young man, despite that, he wanted to, do it but I encouraged him to do it but the key thing to him that was more important to him is that he just want that strength to continue so he can go and eat but he could as well say you know what I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to eat so do we actually follow the will of God to please others or we follow the will of God to please what God really to, to fulfill that God's purpose in our life that's the way to me I say it and just to kind of collaborate what our two brothers have said Pastor Ed Is it still there? It's Pastor true. Ed, are you still there? Mm. Maybe okay. it's, it's going to be distracted because of the little boy. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So so that to me, uh, I don't know whether, don't worry, you have any other things to say on this, but I think our brothers has actually nailed the two part. Just do the will, obey the word, follow mm. the word. God. And as you do that, it's going to help us to actually, it won't have pain. Because if we think about his word every time, it will help us to, to be able to, to, it will influence our decision we make as individual, as a family, as the head of our homes, it will influence it. It's what mm. you think. So, so uh, Noah, do you have anything to add to this? Not really, no. Okay. This is said about that. Uh, I constantly stay in the word that will help us that like, influence our decisions so uh, they're in line with God's will. Yeah. Thank you, Nora. There's Thank a you. text, there's a text in Colossians 3:16. Mm. Um, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, mm. in all wisdom, mm. teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, mm. singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Basically, is to occupy your heart with everything that is God. Mm. The word, his praise, his worship, admonishing, encouraging, teaching, admonishing, correcting, rebuking what you have to, singing, with, and everything done with grace, knowing mm. that but for God, he won't be where you are. And so when we have this kind of posture, or we are in this sort of a situation or context, it'd be difficult not to do the will of God. Okay, I love the, the going back to Joshua 1 8. And the reason we go to Joshua 1 8 so, is to go to that end part of it that you may observe to do all. Okay, so the word of God will not depart from your mouth. You're speaking it, preaching it to yourself and to others. You're thinking about it, meditating, so that you may do what observe to do. So there's the thinking, the speaking, and then doing it. And it's in that doing you get the blessing. And so let this word dwell richly in you dwell in you richly. The wisdom is there. You're teaching and instructional admonition to yourself, to other people in the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as, as given by the Holy Spirit. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I believe yeah. when, when we are in this sort of posture of perspective of life, there's no way we cannot do the will of God. There's no way. Okay. Yes, the temptation will come. There will be competing factors and, and whatever it is, but there is no way we will not be able to. We will not. We will be in line with what God says to do. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Thank you. you, you yeah, it's, it's true. If, if we allowed, before we do anything, there's always this thing, you, there's a meditation, there's something in your mind. What is now your mind that within influence how you then carry out whatever that you've conceived in your in, in your in your decision making or in the process of thinking through the stuff and that forming that in process of forming that decision it depends on what is in your mind if the word of god is always there to to kind of guide you in making that call mm. as we said you are in the midst you are at work and there are some discussion going on you don't want to participate you don't have to you work out what will make you to work out if you cannot if you don't want to speak to these people is god is that what i should be doing now so if the word of god and the, the, the way that god expects us is always there it would definitely help it will underpin the decision we make it will underpin how we react to rich situations even when sometimes it's really really terrible it's kind of very strange and horrible to you it kind of tame you down and relax this year and say, you know what? That my, my friend always tell me this, that when you receive an email, uh, don't just respond because there are some emails that are really, really so upsetting. Uh, and so he said, told me the way he controls himself on this, he has a delay sent on his outlook that every email he said does not automatically just go. He puts something there probably after, after like five minutes he sent it. He said it gives him the time to reflect, to say, is it right what I'm about to say? Because sometimes you could just get an email that is so upsetting that you want to fire back. At yes. that point, you're not thinking. You just fire back straight away. And if you do that later, you now regret. Why did I respond in that way? So he said he tries to put this delay to give him a check to say no, to create a time for him to reflect before he actually sent it. And most times he goes back and change the words before the email goes. So what is, why is he doing that? Because he has some principles in his heart that is guiding what he does to make sure that he's not outside the boundary of what he claims to be as a Christian. You know, so as soon as you say you've said it, he's not guided. So you, you, the key things, Pastor Son and, and Sam, is yes, let the word of God guide you, is the key thing that will underpin us to make sure that we do we practice and we not just hear but we also do as well if he guides us and you have to make that effort to ensure that you apply it as individual and that leads to the last question beloved thank you for all your contribution so far which is basically pastor alluded to this when he was talking about the, the command that he said it should command his household to follow his family to follow God's will. As fathers, how do we guide our family, every member, to be submissive to God's will or wishes? Mm. You mentioned the command, which to me, uh, I will just explain. When, when people talk about God's will, follow God's path, so people think that God, uh, to, to follow the will of God, is to God has to decide every little little detail. Every God has to decide every little little detail. I don't think so because I feel that God also is giving us the power to make that decision. He say, okay, you don't have to be aggressive to others. How you prevent yourself not to be aggressive to others, it depends on you as an individual. God is not going to tell you, this guy, this brother was telling me, he has to put a delay saying on his email to help him to ensure that he guide, even not just when he speaks, but when he writes, he's able to reflect on it. So it's not God that will tell you, go and put that. You have to make that, but you have to think, how do I apply this? So when we follow God's way, God does not detail, de detail or decide every details. He say, he, because every decision that, he, that is taking place in our life, God does not control every aspect of it. Yes. He has given us the freedom. He given us a lot of freedom, but there's also a constraint around those freedoms as individuals. So as family, when you say you command everybody to follow God's will, is it really commanding? Or is to, is to create that pathway to understand that you have all this freedom. What are your boundaries to ensure that you are able to follow it as individual? I just mentioned my son. 
I said, go and pray. These are what you should pray on. But she didn't. It does the way you wanted to do it. Pray for strength to complete the fasting. <laughs> so this is the challenge. And this is what I really uh, like us to speak on. How do we, because everybody, every members in our family, had their unique. They have different characteristics. They have different personality. They have different way of thinking, different way of life. How do you bring everyone along to make sure that whatever part God has placed us on different road in life, whatever part they decide to take in their education, in their career, in marriage, where they want to live in life, where, how they want to live their life, whatever part they decide to choose in life. But in other words, this being influenced and guided by God's will. How do we ensure that that happens? Is it by commanding them to do it? Because I think that doesn't work anymore in this our generation. Because a lot of people, be Christians at home, as soon as they go to campus, they don't even go to church anymore. Okay. They just forget about it. Okay. I think it goes back to... Up. Thank you, Kenneth. I think it goes back to that word command. What do we understand as, as, as command now? Okay, let's say traditionally in the sense of was instruction, in terms of verbal instruction. Now in the present postmodern context, what is command? I like what my friend Reginald said, said these children are observing us. Okay, somebody said, practice what you preach. Okay, so I think we, we win more, we will win the battle much more and readily and quickly and quicker, should I say, when we do what the Bible says, rather than just preach it and don't do it. That was the challenge that Jesus had with the Pharisees. Okay, you, you tell men to do so many things, but you don't do, do this to yourselves. Hypocrites and all that he called them. So to me, the command in this context doesn't have to be verbal instruction that may be interpreted as being so harsh and severe and austere and almost impossible to fulfill. But it's about you doing and living the scriptures living the will of God, that they may see you do it, okay? How do you learn how to drive? You get behind the wheel, beside somebody who knows how to drive, and they teach you what to do. If you were to get into the car by yourself, it'd be difficult, trust me, it'd be very difficult. That's how we learn to drive. Somebody who's done it, who can say, don't do this, slow down, speed up, take it easy. And I think in this case, we become drivers. Instructor drivers, teaching our learner drivers in the house, our family, how to drive this vehicle of life, God's will. So for me, it's more about practice, more about doing the will. Let them see you do it. And the more you do something, the more it becomes permanent with you. So that when you go to the workplace, the workplace, or go to university, when you see something that is not consistent with your character or your practice, the, the natural response to say no, I don't do that. More so when they see the godly value and the good value in terms of relationship with the wider world of humanity. The answer will be, no, we got, that's not how I was brought up, but that's not what I know to do. And they will, of course, I take it that there are certain people that get carried away and misbehave and all that, but majority of people, when they've come from a context of where they know what to do because they've been seen, they've seen it done over and over and over and over again. So when they're outside of that context where their, their belief or their lifestyle or character is being challenged, the natural defense is to say, no, it's not what I know to do. So in, 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 in my summation, I would say the command remains the same. However, how do we do this commanding? You practice it, you do it. Over and over again, I've taught my family and I think I mentioned it in church, Acts chapter 1, verse 1, Luke writes to Theophilus of all that Jesus both began to do and teach, which means he did it and then taught it. Again, in Matthew 5, talking about, about the Beatitudes and all of that, Jesus says, says whoever teaches men okay, and, and, and to do will be called great in the kingdom. So it's about you teach it, don't stop there, leave it. Do it or practice it. And I believe that way we will win the, the, we will win the battle more quicker. Um, 
I, I, I know that Raquel wants to respond quickly to what you have said. No, 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 no. go ahead, sir. And, 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 I also know, and I also know that he's conscious of time. So perhaps he will be looking at people contributing. Then if someone said, oh, um, thank you so much, uh, Pastor. I'm not trying to speak the mind of Ken, but I can try. It. I'm trying to just think about it in that direction. <laughs> you are reading me very well, Brother Samuel. <laughs> yes. Um, what I want to say is this. I have discovered that in the family, because we are now trying to, how do we put it across to them so that everything will be in line with God's will. I want to say here is that children in particular, they learn a lot from our actions. They learn a lot from what we are doing. The language we use, a phone call comes in and you are there and you said, oh, are you at home? And you said, oh, I'm in supermarket. They won't say anything. They are looking at you that day <laughs> inside them. Why not simply tell the person you are at home, but you are not ready to do this now? So if we want to bring our children, our family in that line, that like what Pastor Sonny said, we must live what we are standing for. There is no need of pretending. There is no need of uh, compromising. There is no need of living a double standard life, living differently at home, differently at church. And I, I want to relate just for one minute experience I had. I was working in a place, a group of people. Then this person, I don't want to talk about the area it's coming from, it's not in our community. He said something. He woke up to me, said, Sam, you've been in this place for observe you for one year. There are certain words you don't use. I said, like, what word? He said, F word. I said, it's hard for me. It's not a matter of being pretending. I said, it's hard for me. He said, but why you don't use it? I said, because it's not part of me to use it. The point I'm taking is that anywhere we are, we are the one, our lives, our behavior, our character is preaching, even to our colleagues at work. That is why you see a real Christian, even your boss cannot talk to you anyhow, because he knows that you have principles. You know, he knows that you have certain belief. That's why sometimes when they are talking about bribing, they don't go to certain people. They say, this one will not, will not like us to contribute to do this. So what I want to say there is summary is that we should learn to practice like what pastor said, to practice what we preach because our action, you might read the Bible for the kids for a long time. You might not get like what you are doing. And I pray that God himself Will help us because the people in Antioch were declared Christians not because of the size of their Bible but because of their attitude in Antioch in Acts of the Apostles. They said these are Christ like these are Christians. So our attitude will preach and tell people who we are and our family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Osama. Thank you. Yeah, hundred percent agree to that. It's not what we say, it's really what we do. Yeah. And we ensure that we even be, be more productive to bring and take your family along because they are watching you. You are they are, you are like they are, they are whiteboard and that they are watching, they are seeing. Of course, they have other influences at school, where they go to. There are other influences that could also influence them, but it's really important also play your part in influencing their life. When you have that time to influence them, what part are you showing? Are you actually uh, influencing them by what you just said, by living a, a pretending life, by just making some, some, some statement that you don't know that they are picking on, like, oh, I'm not at home. You're at home, you, you're not ready to, to, to take that call. You're not in the church because you are, you are busy. It's as simple as that. Don't try and create any other excuses. You're not there, you're not there, right? So once they see that, oh, that is always, they, they become to be like anywhere they go, even when they are influenced, I told them, when your friends is trying to influence you, you have something to check and balance with. Okay, this is what my friend is doing, but this is not what we really do. It kind of guide them as well and puts a constraint. As I say, everyone has a part in life. What are the constraints? How do you build those constraints, those borderlines on the road for them so that they don't cross those parts, even when you are not there? But because most of them will leave us, will leave the house. I, I left home when I was started going to off campus, going to school. My parents were no longer there, but I have to follow the values that has been embedded in me to actually focus on what I was there for. So what are the values? 
I, I knew what my father was doing then. I understand the values. I understand what he will expect. Of course, nobody is perfect, but it's us as individuals, as you just said, we have to live what we speak, not just speak and expect people to just listen to us. Thank you. Right, Ed, are you back or you're still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I just, sorry, I was, you know, I have this little boy in the house, he said, be quite a, quite a, <laughs> <laughs> a big man. Really happy to meet you, So, yeah, I've been following by and large. I want to also just make my little contribution to the word, how do you command? See, in terms of uh, command, Pastor Sonny made reference to being in this part of the world, and of course, uh, our definition of command. Um, in, in Bible context, I will say, first of all, the Bible says, train up a child the way he should go, so that when he goes, he will not depart from it. In this, uh, applying the word command, I'll put it this way, it has to do with the stage at which your children are. When my children were young, I will not give a suggestion I will instruct them and I expect them to obey because as young children, they have the propensity to say no to everything. Like my two-year-old boy now, his watch word is, you say yes, he said no, no, no. So I expect him to follow what I am saying and not just what I'm doing. Of course, what I'm doing has to go parallel to that. But then they get to a certain stage, I now sit them down and open the Bible and reason with them from the Bible. Mm. When my children were growing up, we used to say, what will Jesus do when it is in this situation or when he is in this situation? So, and then... I have some of them now that are adults. Some are teenagers and there's a little boy. The ones that are adults, like I'm saying this word command, it depends on the stage that they are in. I will not allow a little boy that is between zero to 12 to decide what they want to do. I'm sorry, that's not, I, I'm from the old school. I will apply the rod, spread the rod and spoil the child. Yes, we don't beat them or abuse them, but I expect my command to be followed. When they now advance in the age of get forward, I will now talk to them, reason to them from them. When they get to adult, I tell my, my, my boys, sometimes when we are locked in some argument, I tell them, go and pray about it and let us revisit this subject in a few days time. Mm. And through that, we are able to discern and get the will of God. And that has helped me uh, to the glory of God. My, my little boy, for instance, who is an adult now, he is 20, going to 24. When he was, we used to do devotion and we teach them, we tell them values and then things that you know, are pleasing to God, things that are abominable and others. So they listen. They have they had devotion, we talked to them. Once there was an experience he had when he got to school, his biology teacher uh, gave them different drawings of the sexes that are accepted in the society. And they were trying to teach them that male and male are accepted, women and women are accepted. My boy raised his hand in class and said, no, I cannot accept this. This is against my value, you know? I will not subscribe to this. And then he taught his, he, he, he made reference to the book of Genesis to his biology teacher. Do you know that through that experience, my little boy now invited his biology teacher to our annual conference. He said, if this boy can stand up for what he believes, even in our day and age, based on what the parents has taught him, Mm. I want to know his father and I want his parents and I want to know the church he attended. We were shocked once we saw a man sitting at the back. And at the end of the meeting, my boy came to introduce and said, he's my biology teacher. 
So <laughs> I, 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 I've, got, <laughs> I've made that example to tell us that, look, we guide them different through different stages of their life. At the early stages, I don't make suggestion to them. I expect to be obeyed when I say something. When they get to a certain stage, I then, of course, reason with them. When they get to adult, I tell, tell them, look, we're not going to argue about all this. We're going to pray about it and meet to discuss. So that's just my little contribution for now. God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. You see, that's why this platform is unique because we're learning from each other. We are understanding and, and understanding how us as fathers, we can, we can work and we can make a success out of our homes. Because when you have a home, we need to protect it. Uh, you don't want to protect it when it's gone. You know, so as even us, uh, we have a teenager um, um, that's not even married yet, but he's learning as well. So thank you. And you said you're right in terms of at different stages, we need to recognize how to deal with our family, how to deal with our children. We need to recognize that. Mm. As if we get that to them, you should understand what works and what doesn't. So it's not like one cuts all. It could be that this is how your child will listen. And as a father, we have to understand what works in our home. But we, the, the primary focus on understanding that whatever you're doing is done with a good motive. That you have, you understand why you're doing it, even when you give them that instruction. You understand why you're giving that instruction and what you're expecting from them. Clear. Uh, really appreciate that contribution, brother. Hey, and that, that that's how we grow up as children, especially when you came from Africa. Your father, even when you are like 30 or 50, your father tells you this is it, and you gotta follow. <laughs> you can't say no. You know, so I appreciate that uh, viewpoint uh, a lot. So, as Brother Sam said, he's already second guessing what I'm gonna do next. I, I know we can continue on this, but I want to respect our time. And, and just in summary, as we go through this, uh, we've gone through as families, as fathers, as, as, uh, as men, how do we understand the constraint that competes with God's will? And we've gone through that. We understand, especially our flesh is always a contender. And how do we as families uh, uh, make ensure that we, whatever decisions we make, whatever uh, uh, directions we set to our family to ensure that is in, is in line or aligned with God's will. There was key thing that struck out there, following God's word, ensuring that God's word is in your heart, is in your mind and directing you. If you always have that, you always, you always be aligned with God. And then we now talked about how do we ensure our family follows that. The key thing is making sure that you don't just do things, but you also, uh, you don't just say things, but you also do it because we are their white board they look at. And uh, commanding, when you want to give them instructions, understand the kind of people, uh, age, understand their ages and how best to be able to relate your information. That's the key thing, bro, Ed is saying. What, what stage are they? What's the best way to relate this information to them? Because children are all different. And you have to understand as a father, the best way you can relate to with your child and the best way you'll be able to communicate and ensure that they understand what you are asking them or asking of them. And then in, fact, in, in conclusion, beloved, is I want to go back to the, what uh, Brother, I think Brother Ed mentioned, which is Romans 12, verse 2. Yeah. And when we look at that verse, God was not prescriptive. He said, do not confirm to, the, to this word, but transformation and renewal of your mind. And then we prove that you prove what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. God does not declare specifically in this word what you should do, but is asking us to listen that his Holy Spirit sharpens our mind. He's mm -hmm. not telling you go to supermarket, go. No, he's saying, allow the Holy Spirit to sharpen your mind, to transform your mind, so that when it's actually that, you'll be inclined to do what is right and what glorifies God. So to, to me, and to, to one, one thing I've gathered from everything we've been speaking here today is, it just, it's as simple, obey the Holy Spirit. 
just follow the spirit of God in you and let the spirit take over and give more opportunity to your flesh. And that's what God is saying. Allow the Holy Spirit to transform and sharpen your mind so that in every decision you take in life is inclined towards what will glorify God and help others. We make a decision to marry, to school, to pursue a career, to raise a family, to go to your work, it will be inclined towards glorifying God and helping others. And I pray that God will help us as fathers, as men, to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to help us in doing this on our day-to-day -day activities in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Pastor. Thank you, Ken. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Gentlemen, what a joy it is to share this fellowship with you. Thank you for attending. Um, before we run off, I'm going to invite Sam quickly to say a word of prayer. Thanking God for this um, uh, meeting today. Sam, before you run off, I know you have another meeting waiting to go to. Quickly. Thank you so much. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to gather together. We are relying on you to help us. We rely on you to help us to the end, oh God. We cannot do most of the things that you expected of us without your grace without your spirit, we ask that you help us at all times and give us the grace that whenever we go short of your glory, we return back to you to seek for help because you are the only one that can help us, help us to the end and help us to take our position as fathers and help us to take our responsibility in our families in Jesus name. Thank you for the brother that you have used today. Yeah. I pray for strength. I pray for wisdom. I pray for knowledge. I pray for the grace to continue to be upon him in Jesus name. I pray. Amen. Amen.